give me a bottle of water. Thank you, son. If you got your Bible, it's good to see Slim sl- uh, slip in. It's good to see you, Slim. <laughs> Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah chapter number 29. You say, preacher, you ought not embarrass folks like that. Well, if you was in my position, you'd do the same thing. Jeremiah 29. We have been dealing uh, on Sunday night, last time, uh, last time we met for preaching, we started dealing with the subject of twisted scriptures twisted scriptures about these verses that are common, these verses that uh, we see on bumper stickers, on t-shirts, on verse-a-day text messages. We, we see these verses all the time, and we don't really know what they mean. We think we know what they mean, but we don't really know what they mean. And because of <coughs> preachers, hirelings, charlatans who uh, don't take the time, they use these verses to twist God's word to make it fit their agenda. And somebody made the comment to me one time, um, well, they're all, you know, it's all Bible. It's all Bible. So, so it's okay to use it. And the argument they was making was that even though it's not what God intended to say, that they could take it and use it anyway. And I told them, I said, man, you got to fall out of the bed many times to be that dumb. You don't get to take God's word You do not get to take God's words and twist them to make them say whatever you want them to say. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11. I want to read this verse to you. I love this verse. I've heard this verse all of my life. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for wholeness, plans for welfare, plans for good things, however your version reads, and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. We hear that verse and our hearts just kind of melts into a comfortable mush. And God has plans for us. God's thinking of me. I'm on God's mind. He's got a future and a hope for me. The problem is we hear people take this verse and we and they they use it to say that God has good plans for you, prosperous plans for you, that God wants good and only good and nothing but good, and all of the good, and just good, good, good. God wants you to be happy and blessed, healthy and prosperous. And anything that happens in life, obviously, anything that happens in life bad, obviously isn't from God. Anything you face that may be uncomfortable, or bad. God's not in that. God wants good stuff and only good stuff for his people. We hear that and we like that, don't we? Man, God wants me to have an Escalade with a tag on the front that says Blescalade and I can get my gangster lean on. God wants me to have my wallet filled. I mean, listen, I believe that God wants me to have a four-door, jacked-up, 2,500 Silverado. I believe that's God's will. I believe God wants me to have the mansion. God wants me... 
And people use this, and they use the Scripture to twist it to fit their agenda that God wants good, only good, and nothing but the good for your life. Well, the only problem with that is life. Life happens. Problems happen. And then what do we do? Well, obviously God doesn't care about me. Because this verse has been used to tell me that God has plans. He wants me to be uh, uh, prosperous. He wants my welfare. He's going to give me a, a future and a hope. He's got all these good plans. And then sickness happens. Cancer happens. Broken heart. Divorce. Bankruptcy. Failures happen. We've spent a lifetime thinking that God only wants to make me happy. And when tragedy happens, we are left arguing and searching for answers. I want to say this right up front. God is more concerned with your holiness than He is your happiness. When people are approached with, with life, they usually... They usually argue two things. First, they'll say, well, God obviously does have a plan. I mean, that's what the text says. He said he got plans. God obviously has a plan for my life. But Satan also has plans, and his plans interfere with God's plans. The problem with this thinking is that we are putting Satan on an equal playing field with God. What we're doing is we're pushing him to a height that he doesn't belong. We have to remember that Satan is a created being. Satan is not the opposite of God. He is not God's other half. He is not the flip side of the coin. They are not opposites. God is God. All by himself. He has no equal. He sits on the throne alone. The Bible says that he sits in the heaven and he does whatsoever he pleases. He's God. People who push and, and refuse to study the nature of God that's laid out in the Bible push this agenda. But the problem is what they're doing is they are destroying the foundational truth of God. And here it is, that God is God. That He's God. He's in control. He's the Creator God, the Sustainer God. The book of Colossians said that all things... You know what that word all means? All. All. All things, all of the things were made by Him. And all of the things were made for Him. And by Him all things consist. There is not one thing outside of His Godship. If God is not God, if God is not in control, if God is not sovereign, then God's not God. Y'all realize that God didn't run for election. He didn't run for office, y'all. He was the only one around when the votes were cast, and there, was not, there wasn't going to be a, a recount. He isn't running for re-election. He's God. He's God. If God wasn't in control, then we could never have the book of Revelation. Like God literally tells us how this thing is going to end. He literally puts it out and says, boom, here it is. He couldn't do that if he wasn't in control. He's God. Well, then people who don't argue that way they argue this. They say, well, God has plans. That's what the Bible says. God has plans. God has plans for my life. 
but I don't have enough faith to obtain those good plans. This is equally damaging to the nature of God, as if God is dependent on his creation. You know, because he can't be God unless I let him be God. That makes as much sense as an inflatable dartboard. You have never, listen to me, you have never had enough faith in and of yourself for him to be God. Never. In the beginning of time, God spoke into nothingness. And God said, let there be. And from that nothingness, everything was. If he can make everything from nothingness without man's approval, permission, or blessing, just by speaking it into existence, what makes you think that God can't be God without you? God has plans for my life. I just don't have enough faith. As if something we can do can give him more power, like we help God. Isaiah said, who is his counselor? He's God. The greatest miracle, uh, one of the greatest miracles that we read about in the New Testament was Lazarus. I like the story of Lazarus, don't you? The guy been dead four days. Everybody give up hope on him. Jesus comes to town. He'd been running late, hanging out with the disciples, and Lazarus died. He missed the funeral, matter of fact. And he got there, and Mary and Martha come up, and they both said the same thing. Martha said it to, to, to his face. Mary said it down at his feet. But both of them said, Lord, if you'd have been here, he, had not, he wouldn't have died. My brother would still be living if you would have been here. And Jesus said, come on, y'all take me to where y'all put him. Take me down there to the grave. They got down there. The Bible says that Jesus wept, the verse that we can all memorize. Jesus wept. And he said, roll the stone out of the way. And they said, Lord, you don't understand. He stinks. Like surely by now, he's smelling pretty ripe. I said, roll the stone out the way. And he called him out and said, Lazarus, come forth. God spoke to a dead man. People who say that, that God has plans for my life, but I don't have enough faith to live in those plans are the same people who look at the story of Lazarus and have to say, well, obviously Lazarus expressed his faith. When? When he was dead? Again, you've got to fall out of bed a lot of times for that. There is a whole crowd of people that is pushing an agenda that says that if you are not living your best life now, it's because you don't have enough faith. And what they're doing is they are heaping an undue burden on God's people. What about the greatest miracle since the dawn of time? When God, Ephesians 2, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, when God saves an individual, you say, well, preacher, I got you beat on that one. I had to express faith on that. Well, you're right, but Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that for by grace are you saved, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. But it's the gift of God. Even the gift of faith to believe on Him is a gift. You say, well, I've got faith within me. Well, Romans 10 says that, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, the faith has to come. That means that I didn't have it, did I? God gives people faith. This is what he's saying. This is, this is what they say. They say that God cannot be God unless I believe that he's God. Let me help you out. God's God, whether you believe it or not. God, if you don't believe it, it doesn't make Him less God. I'm glad you believe, but you believing doesn't make Him more God. 
He's God all by Himself. If He would have never created anything and just existed in nothingness for all of eternity, He'd have still been God. If God would have never chosen to redeem fallen man, but let all of us suffer underneath the condemnation of God, He would have still been God. Listen, because of verses like this that have been ripped, kicking, and screaming out of context, people have, pro people have been propped up to believe in a God that is not the God of the Bible. Amen. Are we having fun tonight? Yes, what we need to understand is three simple words, or three simple concepts, three simple rules. All right, we're going to work tonight. Last time we talked about Philippians 4 and what that context was and how we look at that. See, this is more than me just correcting one verse. This is me helping you to understand how to read the rest of your Bible. There's three simple rules I want you to understand. First is context, context, context. Context, context, context. Every verse is part of a chapter. Every chapter is part of a book, and each book is part of the whole of the Bible. This thing works together. Remember that. Second off, a text can never mean what it has never meant. A text can never mean what it has never meant. If it was not the intention of the human author or the divine author, you don't get to change it to fit your feelings. The Word of God is the Word of God. And when you change it, you are committing high treason against the one who wrote it. Do you realize this is what started us into sin in the garden? Genesis 3, has God really said? God didn't say. They changed it to do whatever they wanted to. A verse can never mean what a verse has never meant. And third thing, narrative is not normative. Narrative is not normative. Let me explain that. There are many Bible narratives that are written that teach us great truths but aren't the normal way God works every time. And by the way, we ought to be real thankful for that. We talked about Jonah this morning, right? God ain't thrown you, uh, uh, thrown you over a boat into the belly of a whale every time you acted stupid, did he? <laughs> we ought to be thankful that those narratives are not normal. What about Acts 5? You remember revivals going on in the book of Acts? The church is growing. People are bringing their offerings. And then Ananias and Sapphira come in, lie. And what happens? God kills them in church. God didn't just allow them to die. God killed them in church. Aren't you thankful that that's not the normal way church discipline goes? <laughs> Narrative is not no normative. So, if we're going to look at this verse, then first we need to apply those rules. That context, context, context. Y'all don't forget this, all right? What's the, what's the first rule in real estate? Anybody. Location, location, location. It's the first rule of hermeneutics or Bible interpretation. Where, what's going on in the context? You need to remember this. Context. That a verse can never mean what a verse has never meant. And that narrative is not normative. Now let's go back to verse number one. Help me out, David. David back there playing Angry Birds on his sleep. <laughs> Jeremiah 29 and verse number 1. This is the, what the Bible says. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet from Jerusalem, uh, that Jer Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets. 
And all the people, when Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. This letter was sent by the hand of that person, the son of that other person, and that other person, the son of Hekai. I know that one. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, it said. Now that's verses 1 through 3. All right. What we need to realize is this, this portion of text was a letter that was written to a specific group of people in a specific time who were living in a specific set of circumstances. What was this specific people? He says to the surviving elders of the exile and to the priest and to the prophets and the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile into Jerusalem and to Babylon. The specific people were the Jewish uh, exiles who were in Babylon. This was written during a specific time. This was early in the Babylonian captivity, around 596 to 585 B.C. These were also written under specific circumstances when Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So Jeremiah 29.11 is a promise to a specific people at a specific time who were living under a specific set of of circumstances. Listen to me. That promise wasn't for you. Hold up, preacher. Hold up. All the Bible's for me. Every promise in the Bible is for me. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Jesus. That promise wasn't written to you. Now, it benefited us. Can I get a witness? Who, the Declaration of Independence. That wasn't written to us. Matter of fact, it was written to England. It was written for us, but it was written to somebody else. See, what we have to understand is in Jeremiah 29, 11, this was a letter written to a group, a real group of people. Now, every Bible promise might not be written directly to us. But every promise in the Bible impacts us. And when rightly interpreted, can even be of great encouragement. But that doesn't mean you get to make it about you. Oh, we're narcissistic when we read the Bible. We're full of ourself when we read the Bible, ain't we? We read the Bible and we think we're the hero of the story. It's all about us. Yeah, my hind leg. When you understand that this promise wasn't made for you, you can begin to find out what it was meant to say to the original recipient and extract the truth of what he was saying to help us. Seeing the context that we see the context of what's going on, we need to address this idea that a verse can never mean what a verse has never meant. Jeremiah 29, 11 is used to say that God wants good. Only good. Nothing but the good. And all of the good for me. And anything bad is not of God. That's what people use it to say. However, the problem with that is verse 4. Look at verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, here it is, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Who sent them into exile? God did. Verse 4 tells us that God is telling His people that the boot of the oppressor is on their neck and God put it there. So, so riddle me this, Batman. How can verse 11 say that God will never do what verse 4 says that He just did? 
A verse cannot mean what a verse has never meant. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had carried away a part of the Jews in the captivity. And God said, I sent him. I'm the one who let this go on. I'm the one who sent you into captivity. Nothing takes God by surprise. I need a witness right there. Nothing takes God by surprise. The old expression, has it ever occurred to you that nothing occurs to God? God never learns. If He learned, then that means that there was something He didn't know. No, God knows it. He never learns. He never, he never becomes more God. Just as He never becomes less God. He is immutable, unchanging, self-consisting. He's God. The Bible tells us in Psalms, in Psalm 121.4 that He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He doesn't take days off. He doesn't get sick. He doesn't take a Sunday afternoon nap. He's God. He's on the throne. He's not just king, but He's the king of kings. He's not just Lord, but He is the Lord of lords. And being that, He's in charge. He's God. If you can believe that God can infinitely and ultimately hold your eternal soul in His hand, why do we have such a t hard time with tomorrow? If God can take care of my eternity, why is it today that we worry about? Think about that. Look at verse number 5. This letter says, build houses and live in them. Now let me remind you, where are they? In Babylon, in Babylonian captivity. They're being oppressed. And this is an inspired letter sent to these people who were being oppressed. And he says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare you will find for your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dreamed. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. God tells his people to settle in. Get comfortable because you ain't going nowhere for a little while. But wait a minute. I thought that if I asked God would get me out of this trouble. Well, he didn't on these folks. God says, you need to build your house. You're going to get hungry, so you need to plant you a garden. You need to be a profitable member of society. He said you need to increase. Have some babies. Have some grandbabies. You're not coming out. See, in chapter 28, the chapter that precedes this, there was a false prophet named uh, Haniah who was running around saying that God was going to break the yoke of bondage. He gave the people a false hope telling them that everything was going to be all right. Hananiah was called the prophet of peace. And he condemned those who brought a message of judgment. He tells the people not to worry because he had heard from God. And within two years, everything was going to be okay. 
Matter of fact, in, in 28, in chapter 28, verse number 10, Haniah takes a wooden yoke and actually breaks it. And he says, God is breaking the yoke. Man, this sounds like, this sounds like false teacher 101. He takes a yoke and breaks it and said, God is breaking the yoke. You're going to have freedom. You're going to have power. You're going to be prosperous. Just claim it. Let's roll on. God said, don't listen to them, them jokers. And then he says, the preaching, this, this yoke destroying preaching. Jeremiah tells them that in breaking that yoke of wood and giving the people false hope, he was actually putting them under a deeper bondage. You ever met people that, or, or let's, let's, let's be personal tonight. My wife, is it all right, baby? She, she said, I don't know what you're about to say. My wife, my wife struggles with, with depression. Most of y'all know that. If y'all don't, uh, well, now you do. My wife struggles with depression. And it's amazing. We had a lady come to church with us. We thought God sent her. We found out it wasn't God that sent her. Um, <laughs> She was a blessing for a long time. I enjoyed her. I loved their family, good family. But they came and they was apart, and she really attached to my wife. And she was a great encouragement for a little while. And then she found out that my wife battled depression. She said, well, that's, that's a demonic spirit. And if you had enough faith, you wouldn't have those problems. Again, I rolled out of the bed many times and hit my head, but I ain't never been that dumb. <laughs> she told my wife that if my wife just had enough faith, you know what that did? That didn't help her. It put an unnecessary burden upon her. Because now, not only is she struggling with depression, not only is she struggling with, with darkness and problems and all of that, now she feels like it's all her fault. That's what was going on in the book of Jeremiah. He broke that yoke and Jeremiah said, Hey boys, that, that prosperity preacher down there makes everybody feel good, pats them on the back, you know, you know name it and claim it and just run on. That, that guy down there who's giving you all this false hope, all he's doing is putting an unnecessary bondage upon you. He said by preaching and breaking that yoke, he's actually putting you under a stronger yoke. So God said in Jeremiah 29, verse number 8, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. He said, don't be fooled. And do not listen to the dreams that they dreamed. Why? It's a lie! God made it clear that this crowd that was running around giving false hope that we were not to give, or they were not to give an ear to those people. So in Jeremiah 29 10, he says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Now put verse number 11 up there for me, David. It's only after that that we have chapter or verse number 11. Amen. There's a context to this thing. This verse cannot mean that God only want if God only wanted health, wealth and prosperity, then the disciples were living way outside of God's will, weren't they? Amen. They were killed with the sword. They were crucified upside down burned at the stake. They were sideways with God. What about Jesus? If God only wanted good things and great things for those that He loves, then why was His only beloved, begotten, treasured Son crucified? If God just wanted happiness. A verse can never mean what a verse can ne has never meant. And this narrative, what's going on in this story, 
doesn't mean that we get to make it normative. Do you see? You say, well, preacher, you've just shot everything that I thought. You know, I have enjoyed this verse on my coffee cup and my bumper sticker for the last 10 years. And thank you for on a Sunday night, absolutely butchering that cow. <laughs> if that's not what it means, what does it mean? Let me help you out. Three quick things. God does have a wonderful plan for our life. Amen. You are where you are, not by accident or coincidence. You are not facing what you are facing because God let something slip through his fingers. Think about the life of Joseph. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, put as a slave into Potiphar's house. He was lied on at Potiphar's house and thrown into prison. In prison, he was forgotten about. But do you know at the book, end of the book of Genesis what Joseph said? He said, you meant it for evil. You know what meant means? It means designed. You thought about this. You planned this. You meant it for evil. But then the Bible says, but God meant it. The Bible doesn't say God turned it. God meant it for good. God does have a wonderful plan for our life. The wonderful plan for Paul's life is that he would have his head chopped off. The wonderful plan for the John's life was that he would be exiled to the Isle of Patmos. God does have a wonderful plan for our life. God never forgets his people. Psalm 37 and verse number 23 tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God never one time turned his back on his children while they were in captivity. What about that? This letter, this letter here in this portion of Scripture is actually said to be written to Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, and Shadrach, those exiles who were in Babylonian captivity. When you look at their lives, did God ever leave them? They decided not to defile themselves with the king's meat. And they fared ten times better. They decided they wouldn't bow to the image. And they was thrown into the fire. But there appeared a fourth man as appearing of like the Son of God with them. And they weren't burned. Do you remember in Daniel chapter number 10? Daniel's praying and he cries out. And he says, God, I've been praying for 21 days. I, I feel like you've left me. I feel like you've forgotten me. And the, and the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Daniel, I've been down there fighting the prince of Persia, but from the first day that you called out, I heard you. God never forgets his children. Ever. And lastly, we learn from this, this text that our hope is not in ourselves but God. Our faith is not in our ability or our capability. Our faith is not in our present circumstances or even the culture around us. Our faith is not in our community or even our church. Our faith is not in politicians and our faith isn't even in preachers. Our faith is not in our faith. It's in Christ. Amen. Jesus tells them that if they have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, they could move a mountain. It wasn't the size of the faith, but rather it was the faith in the size of the God. It's not about the size of your faith. It's about the big God that we serve. Having faith 
in him. Look at verse number 12. Verse number 12 says this. Then you will call. You'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When? When you seek me with, your, with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to this place from which I sent you into exile. You know, God tells this crowd, the reason we're doing all of this, the reason you're going through what you're going through, is because I'm going to bring you out of this thing. You're going to learn how to call on me. You're going to learn how to reach out to me and pray to me. I love Jeremiah 29, 11. But when we use it, we don't need to present a false hope. Tell people that God is, you know, the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. Or God is some genie in a bottle that we can come and, and rub our Bible and He shows up and grants our every wish. No, He's God. He's King. <clears throat> Creator and sovereign. And he doesn't, he, he's not a lucky rabbit's foot that you get to pull out and stroke and make you feel good. He's God. God does have a wonderful plan for our life. God never forgets his people. And our hope is not in ourselves but in God himself. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the word of God. I pray that you take this, use it to be an encouragement. God, may you teach us all how to rightly divide the word of truth. May you teach us all how to correctly interpret scripture. Lord, may you help us as we grow to be right Christians. Lord, to this week as we go our separate ways, uh, just as I prayed this morning, Lord, I pray that you put a burden on our hearts for the lost people around us. God, we're not very good Christians. I'm not a very good Christian. But God, you're bound and determined to make a Christian out of me. So help us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. I need to make a quick announcement. Um... um Food pantry is this Friday, all right? We, um, we are low. Um, the, the other churches are reaching out and gonna, um, they're going to be bringing some collections too. But I wanted to let you know, all right? If you go grocery shopping, I think several of y'all have done this before. Pick up some extra things. Um, if you're like Slim and you don't want to go anywhere where there's two buildings that are more than you know, 100 yards closer together. You don't want to go shopping. Um, you know, Miss Marion will do that for you, so get with her. You, she'll be glad to do donation. Um, but um, but uh, remember that. Is there anything else? Hallelujah. God bless you. Miss Ella, I'm glad you came tonight. Yeah, ain't y'all glad Miss Ella came? I love you, Miss Ella. Hallelujah. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday.